Okay, so good morning, everybody. My name is Marcello, and I've been working in Innsbruck in the past years, and I just moved to ICTP. And the topic I want to talk about today is actually slightly off the, the conference main goal, which is RG. There will be something also about RG. Uh, but we'll mostly deal with uh, how we try to realize dynamics of lattice gauge theories in synthetic quantum systems. Uh, and the conundrum of all of this is really uh, try to approach lattice gauge theories, a very, very broad concept, using quantum information type tools. And what I want to show you in concrete are actually three examples. Let me just briefly mention what I will tell you at the end of the day. One is how to build analog simulators, analog quantum simulators of lattice gauge theories using ultra cold atoms trapped by light, optical lattices. The second thing I want to tell you, which will be very brief, unfortunately, is how we can design novel algorithms to tackle exactly or quasi exactly the real time dynamics of lattice gauge theories using methods which are actually uh, motivated from time-dependent density matrix normalization group techniques or gauge tensor networks. And the last thing I want to show you is actually how we can use a quantum computer, well, a very small one, uh, to realize the dynamics of some interesting phenomena in, in uh, lattice gauge theory. In particular, in this case, I will show you the first experimental realization of a Schwinger model using trapped ions. So these are the, mostly the two topics I will talk about. So the outline is then what I want to tell you very briefly what these synthetic quantum systems actually are. Define the challenge and then use as a work source, a work source the, Sch the Schwinger model to tackle these three different paradigms. Okay? So what are the synthetic many-body quantum systems? I think some of you most, most probably have heard of, of those. These are systems which are composed of many degrees of freedoms. These are many-body systems uh, where the interaction actually can be microscopically tailored by means of external uh, fields. Yeah? So we can control these many-body quantum systems. And there are nowadays many experimental platforms where this can be done. Uh, the most prominent one, I think, is, at least from my perspective, is ultra-cold atoms and molecules. And here you see these are snapshots of a quantum system where people are able to image lattice models side by side, quantum by quantum. So there is really genuine single quantum control. Uh, nowadays, there are also many experiments using superconducting circuit, circuit architectures, and these are just a few pictures to illustrate that. Uh, there are also trapped ions, and there are many more, okay? Photonic system, cavity QED, engineered materials, and so on and so forth. So this is really a huge field which is developing mostly thanks to technological advances. So the point is, which kind of physics, once you realize uh, this physical system, you can explore? I think there are two scenarios. I mean, one is that, that I mean, in, this engineered quantum system allows us to study phenomena that have been confined to theory only for a long while. And the examples that I find most amazing are actually integrable systems whose, I mean, physical realization are usually very hard to, uh, to get. I mean, in this, in this cold atom gases, for example, one can realize those dynamics. And one, one can also study the out of equilibrium dynamics very accurately, you know, which is in an isolated system, which is not that easy, for example, in condensed meta settings. Uh, and the second motivation for studying this quantum system actually traces back to Feynman, and is to use them as quantum simulators of, uh, of theories that otherwise we can't really solve, either by analytical or numerical means. So what is, in few words, the idea of quantum simulators? I mean, this is really Feynman's 1982. It's quite pioneering. He said, OK, nature isn't, isn't classical. Okay. So if we want to simulate it, at some point, we need to use quantum hardware, okay? And this is in 82, it's quite amazing. Uh, and the, the reason for a condensed matter theory, as I am, is actually quite simple. I mean, suppose that you want to study some Hamiltonian and which, uh, which works on a certain Hilbert space. The dimension of the Hilbert space scales exponentially with the number of degrees of freedom. So as far as it gets, I can't fight this, okay? And imagine that you want to tackle, for example, a spin system. Exactly, you are limited to 30 spins. This is very far from thermodynamic limit. Okay? So that's the essence of this, of, of this intuition. And obviously, I mean, as theories, many methods have been developed uh, to undergo a circumvent this problem. 
But I think there is still physics at equilibrium, which is very hard to solve by control means. And the typical example uh, are fermions at finite density because of the sign problem. Um, and there is also the other problem that for time evolution, uh, real time evolution of quant many particle quantum systems, we do not know uh, what, I mean, a controlled method that can be applied in a genetic sense. Uh, and just, I want to give you this, this kind of comparison. Yeah? What a quantum simulator can try to do uh, compared with uh, one of the most powerful supercomputers on Earth at the moment. Um, this actually is an experiment. These dots are an experiment. This is an observable as a function of time. It's actually not important what this observable is. Uh, and these dots here are a quantum simulation. I wouldn't really call it quantum simulation, but a cold atom experiment that traces this observable as a function of time. And you see, okay, it can go on forever. I mean, this is, this is okay. I mean, it's an experiment you just measure. And on the, black, on the black line here, you can see the most accurate theory for this type of problem, which is in this particular case time-dependent DMRG, run on the most powerful supercomputer. And you see at some point this breaks down. And this is really trying to fight an exponential scaling. Yeah? So classical computations have, have, in some cases, limitations that quantum computers do not have, simply do not have. So this, this is, in, in essence, the, the intuition of Feynman made real. And just, I mean, these are a couple of slides that, uh, that illustrate briefly what the approaches are. So what are analog and classical simulators? I think most of you know. I mean, analog simulators have a very long history from Antikythera to current machines. Uh, sorry, analog simulators from current machines like wind tunnels, where we cannot solve, for example, hydrodynamic equations. While digital simulators are a bit... Um, more modern in terms of concepts, because there we can control error. I think the first worldwide example is probably the Pascaline, and nowadays we have supercomputers. At the very same level, you can do the same stuff with quantum technologies. So you can define the same two columns with quantum technologies. You can have analog simulators. Well, you can have digital simulators first, obviously. They, they are the equivalent of our computers, of our classical computers. And the basic idea there is that if you want to solve the evolution of some time-dependent problem, you trotterize it, you decompose into gates, exactly as, as you do on a computer. You decompose certain operations into, into a set of even more fundamental operations. Okay? Uh, there is also the analog side. Okay? The basic idea there is actually to do exactly like the wind tunnel. The wind tunnel, you want to simulate a very large plane. You, can't, you don't want to build one for each time you actually do that. And you don't, you don't want to have a wind tunnel, which is, I don't know, 100 meters large. So what you do is you take a small one. We do the same here. You want to simulate certain theory. You do it. You build it in a smaller, in a smaller uh, setting, uh, which you can control. And then you study the time evolution of the ground state properties or what you're interested in. There is also a third option. If you have 50 million dollars, you can try to buy a quantum annealer. But the fact that this really works, I don't know. I, don't, I think it's recorded, so I won't say anything about this. So, and just as a comparison, I mean, this is the analog line. When you talk about, when people talk about analog quantum simulators, really think about wind tunnels kind of experiments. When, when people talk, uh, talk instead about digital quantum simulators or quantum computers, think about really just adapting the computing strategies of qu classical simulation to quantum systems. Uh, there are some highlights I will just flash through. I mean, in this, uh, in this synthetic quantum system, several things have been done at the, at the experimental level. Some long-standing field theories have been realized. Uh, I mean, ABAR models have been realized as well. And one has control at the single particle level. Uh, but this is, until now, not of interest to us. We are interested in gauge theories. This is completely different. Uh, from the point of view of gauge theories, what has been done, well, not on gauge theories, but uh, on gauge fields, what has been done is the realization of static, so background classical gauge fields. Yeah? And just as a reminder, I mean, the typical example of a, of a static gauge field is is the, the so-called offsetter model. You have a particle running on a square lattice. And what happens is that the tunneling of this particle is actually assisted by a classical field, so a phase. Okay? And it's known that these phases actually I mean, have certain importance in many condensed matter phenomena. And this has been realized for bosons a long while ago and for fermions recently. And what has been observed is also the possibility of having a um, skipping orbit and edge currents in this kind of uh, in this kind of cold atom setting. However, I want to emphasize this is classical. Okay? These are classical fields. This is, there, is, there is no gauge symmetry here. Okay? So the challenge that, that I mean, we have is actually 
to identify a, a method of doing that. Obviously, gauge fields are not important only in the context of particle physics, even there, I mean, even though this is the origin of all of that. They have importance, as we have seen also in the talks yesterday, in condensed matter system, like QED3 theories. They have also some importance in topological quantum computing. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to discuss these two. I will focus mostly on this part. But just to tell that, I mean, the impact is, is of gauge theory is obviously enormous. Yeah? Uh, and why we want to do that, I think one, one, uh, one main motivation for designing actually quantum simulators for gauge theory is that gauge theories are ubiquitous, this we just said. They exhibit extremely rich physics, uh, and they are challenging many body problems. Okay? Okay? Very challenging, as most of you know <laughs> much better than I do. Uh, another perspective is actually to, to, to look at them as computing, uh, uh, computing uh, challenges, and this is the DOE usage of supercomputers, I think it's 2009. And you see lattice QCD in terms of fundamental science is one of the most intense, uh, resource intense activities. So I think it's also a good idea if you want to really build a quantum simulator, which is not an easy deal, to try to focus it on problems which are really, really challenging and important. There is a problem, however. I mean, we are used to write uh, Lagrangians uh, and field theories in general in continuum. And here we want to create a create a connection with this synthetic quantum system, which are usually made out of spins, out of fermions, out of bosons. Uh, so the first challenge on the theory side is that we have to pick up a formalism to establish this link. Okay? Uh, and I think there are quite some interesting options around, also developed in recent years. The one that we picked up um, is actually stimulated very much by the work of Eugen Svise and other people also before him. Uh, it is a quantum link model, and I'm going to briefly explain what it is about in a few slides. So the first challenge, pick up the formalism. Then we have to identify strategy to get a gauge symmetry, because they are not there in the systems, uh, I mean, at least naively thinking. Um, and then we have to find physical incarnations. OK, here we go. Sorry. Ah, OK, just as, uh, I mean, as I told you at the beginning, I mean, we will do that in the context of the Schwinger model, not because of limitation of do, dealing just with a simple theory, it's just because, I mean, all the procedure is simpler. Most of these techniques that I want to tell you about can be extended to higher dimension, and some of them, not all of them, can also be extended to non-abelian lattice gauge theories, yeah? So, analog simulator, neural algorithms, and quantum computers. So, brief review of the Schwinger model. Uh, this is QED in one plus one dimension, so one spatial and one temporal dimension. Um, I mean, you can see the Lagrangian, I mean, or from the original paper here, uh, and the important parameters are the mass and the gauge coupling. Then this no describes nothing but charges, particles coupled to a U1 gauge field in 1D. And the fundamental degrees of freedom, if you think about it, I mean, this is just electron and positrons, and there are electric fields, there is no magnetic field, there is no transfer of degrees of freedom. And if you are interested in its dynamics, um, why is this interesting, actually? Uh, because this model, like QCD, actually shows confinement yeah? uh, in, in a much simpler form, but it's still there. Uh, can show dynamical stream breaking, which is what I'm trying to illustrate here. So if you try to pull two particles, well, a particle and antiparticle, at some point the string just breaks, and then you have creation of mesons. Uh, and in addition, if you want, you can also study some non-trivial topology because you, I mean, differently from quantum network dynamics in other dimensionalities, here a topological term can actually be in introduced and has strong effects, as was shown by Coleman. Okay? So, and these are just meson. This is the string breaking. And I mean, when I talk about this stuff, of course, you are still telling me, okay, uh, keep your feet on the ground, and this is what I'm trying to do. But just saying, okay, some of these phenomena are still extremely interesting and not fully understood, and uh, I mean, these are remarkable simulation on the stream breaking of QED uh, of the Schwinger model done in a group of uh, Jürgen Berges in Heidelberg. And just to tell that this kind of phenomena, even in the simple models, are still to be uh, fully understood, especially the time-dependent ones. Um, so we have this interesting physics. Uh, and the point is we want to study a certain phenomenon. I mean, we want to focus on a single one. Uh, stream breaking is quite hard, but, so, but let me tell you something different. I mean, we can study, for example, a Schwinger mechanism. Okay? We start from a vacuum. If we quench the vacuum, we, start, we will start having particle-antiparticle production because QED vacuum is unstable to that. And what happens is really nothing but this. I mean, this is the axis of time, and this is our vacuum state. You will start having particle-antiparticle creation. Uh, and this is interesting not only from the theoretical side, again, 
but because in some high intensity laser facility, people are actually trying to study this. Okay? Obviously, this is the true theory. This is QED in, four, in three plus one dimension. But the Stringer model still will allow us to understand this mechanism if we can compute its time dependent dynamics or if we can quantum simulate that in a rather accurate way. Um, so, now if we want to engineer that in a synthetic quantum system, we have three main challenges. The first is how to represent matter and antimatter. I mean, here we just have fermions or bosons, how do we do that? The second one is how to introduce the gauge fields and now how we can realize the proper dynamics. Most of these problems actually were solved by, by other people, yeah? and this is uh, mostly taken from lattice QCD uh, uh, literature, so let me briefly tell you a few things. Okay? Um, the first problem is actually that we want to have the ingredients all in the same slide, and this is what it is. If we have a not, for, not so formal definition of a lattice gauge theory, what we need as ingredients are a set of fields acting on vertices, the fermions, the matter fields, and on bonds or links, the gauge fields. We will need a set of generators, which define our gauge symmetry, uh, and they will have certain commutation relations, obviously. The physical Hilbert space will be defined by, by Gauss's law, or in our case, it's just one Gauss law. Uh, and then, since we are uh, interested in more in a Hamiltonian formulation, that La uh, Lagrangian formulation, we will need to define certain objects which are our gauge variant Hamiltonians that commute with all the generators. And obviously, they, are, they, they contain both the fermion fields and the parallel transporters. Um, now, the first thing, how we deal with the fermions, this is easy. We can just use staggered fermions that most of you probably know. Uh, so we represent on odd sides electrons and even sides positrons. So that just a single tunneling of a particle over the bare vacuum creates an electron-positron pair. And the corresponding mass here, because of the staggering, just comes with a factor of minus one to the x in front. So staggered fermions, the fermions are easy. Okay. And this is easy in general. Now. The fermion part. The hard part is usually the gauge fields. So the problem about the gauge field is that it's extremely hard to get a quantum simulator of a parallel transporter. Actually, I think there is still, until nowadays, not, not an even single paper that points out a solution for this problem. So we had to deal with another formulation of lattice gauge theory, and we use these quantum links introduced by Uwe, introduced actually by Orn first in the 80s, then rediscovered by Orland, and then by Uwe in the 90s. Uh, and there, the idea, let me tell you very briefly, without any technical detail, is to replace, for U1 theories, the parallel transporter with a lowering, uh, so with an increasing spin operator as plus. Uh, and since the uh, electric field has to be in another basis, this will be nothing but a sigma z operator or sigma 3 operator. Uh, the effective Hamiltonian for the, for the lattice Schwinger model in the kogus saskin formulation using these quantum links is actually quite simple. Here you have a term which couples the matter fields, the tunneling of the matter fields, with the gauge field. This will be U in a conventional lattice gauge theory. You have a second term here. Um, this, is, this is the matter field interaction. The second term we have already seen. This is the, the staggered mass of the staggered fermions. And then you have a third term, which is nothing but the electric field square term. Okay? That's all you can have in one plus one dimension. You cannot have any magnetic field. Uh, and just as a cartoon, I mean, what happens? Imagine that this is your physical state that you engineer in your quantum system. What you require is that every time a fermion tunnels from one particle to the other, from one side to the other, there is a spin flip of the corresponding degree of freedom that lives on the bond. So what happens is that something like this is allowed, while the single tunneling of a fermion is not allowed because of Gauss law. Uh, obviously, one can go on and work out the full gauge invariant Hilbert space. This is not extremely interesting, and this will depend uh, most importantly on the representation of the spin. One can do that, and then there are sites which are not allowed, so, uh, configuration which are not allowed, configuration which are allowed, so they are gauge invariant and gauge variant configurations. Um, but what is important for us is how, to, how we actually get these dynamics. And in order to, sh to show you, I mean, I will just do it as a at a cartoon level and not tell you the full story. If you're interested in the full story, I will do that. So imagine that now that you have a model of just two sites with a boson and a fermion degree of freedom. So these guys, the blue one, are fermions, and the, um, the orange one is a boson. This microscopic, very minimal system is actually described by the following Hamiltonian. You, have, you can have tunneling of fermions, TF, this first term. You can have tunneling of bosons, the second term here. And then you can have interaction in case the boson and the fermions actually sit on the same site. What happens in perturbation theory, this is 
really simple, I mean, second order perturbation theory in U, is that the effective dynamics of the system, whenever a boson tunnels, kicks the fermions on the other side because it has to pay an energy price U. So the process will not be resonant. And if we write this boson degree of freedom using the Schwinger representation, what one gets, just at this very man, minimal building block level, is exactly the Hamiltonian that we will need in terms of gauge matter interaction in the Schwinger model. Okay? So this is exactly what we need. And I mean, this kind of Hamilton actually have been already realized using just bosons, so slightly different in many experiments, especially in Munich at the JQI. Uh, and what is important is that even out of the very simple example here, you can understand there are local conserved quantities. Obviously, here they are rather trivial, so they are not associated to any, any gauge symmetry, but once, once you scale the system up, so you really do it fully, and you can do that using different ingredients coming from the optical lattice technology, uh, this becomes a true gauge symmetry. You just need to have a boson degree of freedom that assists, that lives on bonds and realizes the gauge field, a fermion degree of freedom that just realizes the fermions, staggered fermions, and then you need a second, bosons because, second boson because of technical reasons. Okay? So we know how to, how to get uh, very simple gauge theories, in particular U1, in one plus one dimension, uh, using cold atoms in optical lattices. And in this case, for example, we can try to observe stream breaking. This is no problem. Really, that's something that you can realize, that you can see in real time. Uh, and this was actually mostly motivated by the numerical experiments by Jürgen. Uh, and we have also simulated what will happen in a cold atom experiment. Indeed, you will have electric field relaxation starting from a very strong electric field in the middle, as you have here. This then relaxes. Obviously, there will be light cones here. And we, can, we could see the same doing numerical experiments on the cold atom model, which is slightly different from this formulation. Okay. So also the interesting phenomena are actually observable. Uh, just a bonus slide, I think I'm running not that great with time, just to tell you that, okay, this was a billion until now. Some people would say, okay, thanks, you can do perturbation theory. Um, in some cases, it's also possible to do non-abelian. For non-abelian, there are severe limitations, so not all groups are accessible. But what we found out, and also other people uh, found out, is that uh, for UN groups, with N until 10, and for SU2, maybe SU3 groups, SU3 is already very challenging, there are ways of realizing these systems using, in particular, uh, fermionics species, which are called alkaline earth atoms. And these are just species which have two outer electrons in the S shell. And magics, uh, nature makes some magic and realizes na naturally SU, SU n symmetries in these atomic systems, which is then the, the basic building block to realize these non abelian gauge theories. I, w I will really just not discuss what, is, what our implementation are based upon. They're based upon the fact that we can actually use embedding algebras on the link degrees of freedom and then translate all this Hamiltonian and embedding algebra language to the cold atom settings. Uh, and, well, okay, that's it. But if you are interested, I will. I will be happy to discuss you in more in detail than on a billion case. Uh, so let me come back to a billion. So what I told you is this analog simulation route to the, to the Schwinger model. Uh, let me briefly flash through these uh, novel algorithms, I mean, based on these gauge tensor networks. I mean, the problem is that real-time dynamics we know is hard. Uh, but in one dimension, there are algorithms which are based on renormalization group, time-dependent renormalization group, that are actually allowed, this, allowed to do that for conventional models, like easy models, upper models, and all that. Um, what we found out is actually that these models are very easy, or can be extended, in, in, a, in many cases, to gauge theories. Yeah? We were obviously not the only ones. Also, there was work at ICFO and uh, in Vienna on these topics. And what we have done is we have studied the stream breaking dynamics in real time. Also including entanglement, which is not possible to include in, in other kind of treatments. And uh, I just want to tell you that this is something in, that is potentially interesting. Um, and if you're interested in, in discussing more about this, I will be very happy to do that. So last point, I think, OK, uh, is about the quantum computer. Okay? So quantum computers, we have seen already. In the, in the context of, uh, of experiments, these are called digital quantum simulators. And the idea is get an Hamiltonian, trotterize it, so this means decompose into operation that you can actually perform, and then observe the outcome of your computation, of your experiment. Yeah? 
Um, this approach is very powerful in the sense that you can solve generic problems. It's really like using a classic, uh, classical computer. You can just arrange your set of operations, in this case, arrange your set of laser configurations and all that um, to design the problem that you're interested in. Uh, the problem is that this is also very hard to realize. Okay? You have to pay a price okay? in the sense that the available resources are extremely limited. Okay? I think until nowadays, the best quantum computer that is on the market has six pins. I think all of us here can code six pins very quickly, I mean, on a classical computer. Um, so our goal, in order to somehow uh, exploit this uh, flexibility, but at the same time do something which is, has to be efficient, was to define efficient quantum software that can realize the engaged theories. And this, again, um, we did take inspiration from, from uh, literature in the energy context. We focused on the now on the Wilson formulation of lattice gauge theories with this colleague in his group, Christina, Marcus, Philip, and Peta, um, the Schwinger model. And there is some magic. As you know, in one plus one dimension, one can integrate out the gauge fields analytically. Okay? And what you get out of this, you have to pay a price. When you integrate out the gauge fields analytically, you get extremely long-range interaction. The Hamiltonian will be highly non-local and will be also, I have to say, quite fuzzy. This was, for example, what was done in this paper here. So you have translated the challenge from engineering the gauge symmetry to engineering uh, an Hamiltonian, which is highly no local, breaks a lot of symmetries and all that. But still, it's exactly, it's exactly the Schinger model, so the mapping is exact. It's just an integration. This strange flip-flop term is nothing but the reminiscence of the gauge field coupling. The second term will be the staggered mass of the fermion. Uh, and the last one will be the electric field squared that you have seen after integration, obviously, is highly non local. Um, and so, okay, once we realized that, we went to the group, to Rainer Blatt, and to his group. They have a power, I mean, one of the most powerful quantum computers. I mean, this is based on calcium 40 ions, uh, and this is their physical qubit, and this is their imaging technique. I mean, this is not of interest to us. And we told them they can, they can look at spin models. Uh, uh, and we designed a, a precise protocol to, to do that efficiently, and the first data were actually quite interesting. They could do that. They could study four spins, which is equivalent to four, uh, to two uh, electron, two positrons, and three gauge fields. Uh, and then we told them, okay, look, since the preliminary results were so good, try to study the Schinger mechanism, and this is what they did. They really engineered a state in an initial vacuum, I have to say that this is not the, the non-interacting vacuum, it's the strong coupling vacuum. So it's slightly different from the original Schwinger uh, paper. And what they study is how strong, I mean, what is, um, as a function of time, this axis, how many particles are actually produced. Okay? Uh, and obviously, this, is, this depends on the value of, of, of the mass of the electron. I mean, the stronger the mass, the less particles are produced. Uh, and this was our numerical experiment theory, very simple to do, uh, and they could observe the same stuff, uh, which is uh, quite, uh, quite amazing. I mean, they had limitation in the mass. They couldn't go to very large masses for technical problems, but uh, in the regimes that they could assess, the agreement was, was very good. Obviously, once you have a quantum computer, you are not limited to measure just local observable. You can measure a lot of stuff, well, a lot, some stuff. Um, and what they can measure, for example, is uh, what in the context of the original Schwinger paper is called vacuum persistent amplitude. Uh, that nowadays has been rediscovered in quantum information is called loschmidt tycho It's basically the, the, the overlap of the initial vacuum with the time evolved vacuum. And this they could also measure. Uh, and they saw that, as predicted by Schwinger originally, this is actually perfectly matched with the, with the particle uh, production rate. Finally, what they could also do is to study entanglement propagation. Uh, this was a bit harder and cannot be scaled up once the system will become larger, so I will not discuss this, but uh, since the, there, there are, I mean, a lot of connections nowadays between entanglement theory and, uh, and high energy, I think it was an interesting proof of principle that this, at least, in some, in some cases, can be done. Good. So, obviously, we, were not the only one. <laughs> we are not the only one working on this. There are many other groups. Um, working on these ideas, especially on this first topic, eh? on this second one a bit less. Um, and here you can find, uh, I mean, something which is already, I, I, maybe it's also partial, I'm missing some references, I apologize for that. Just to say, okay, obviously we're not the only ones. I am done.
we are at the open questions. Thank you. Uh, so there are many questions that still need to be set in these fields. Uh, and uh, this is just a flash. Uh, I think another important point is that uh, from our side, there is really uh, a, a kind of need of getting new formulations of gauge tiers. This is something that we are extremely interested in uh, because we have really problems, serious problems working with Wilson theories. Wilson theories are extremely challenging to be adapted to experiments. Quantum links are very good, but there may, may be other way, way of formulating gauge theories which are simple enough that are even easier than quantum links. And in that case, this will really speed up experimental realization. Uh, what we are working on, I mean, there is also another problem which is very serious, is the continuum limit. I think in this case, we know how to address it, at least for specific models. Um, and there are other things that we are still trying to tackle from the theory side. And these are just very partial answers to some of these questions. Uh, okay, so let me thank again my collaborators in Innsbruck, the group of Uwe Jens in Bern, uh, Enrique and Marcus in Bilbao and Swansea, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>